Justice Tech Pros here. Um, actually looking forward to today's episode. It's a lot sooner than normal uh, in between episodes. And that's because after I spoke about the show that I wound up watching on Showtime called Outcry, I reached out to one of the individuals on the show. His name is Jake Bryden. And what really got me um, intrigued was this person was not related to the case, had no vested interest in the case, but yet took it upon himself to get involved and fight for what's right. And I just, you know, I found that fa- admirable and fascinating. So uh, I reached out and thankfully, you know, he agreed to have a, a conversation so we could pretty much, he could actually let the public know, let the listeners know about what takes place where it relates to prosecutorial misconduct and how when somebody is a target, what they have to endure and what they go through. And, and again, what's most fascinating to me is this person really had no ties to this case, had no vested interest, and really was just behind what was right and what was wrong. And he backed up what was right and he fought for what was right. And with that said, uh, allow me to welcome guest Jake Bryden. Okay, Jake, um, it's a pleasure to have you on. I really thank you for taking the time. And uh, I wanted to reach out to you because I was so outraged after just watching episode one of the new series, Outcry. And um, I was fascinated by your role in the in the story. So I was wondering if, uh, for those who haven't watched it, aren't aware, um, if maybe you could just enlighten us and kind of walk us through, you know, your role and what sparked you to really get involved and, and what took place. Yeah, Dominic, that's totally my pleasure. Um, you know, I got involved because of a high school teacher that I had. We call him Coach Anderson. Uh, he was always my leadership coach. He led the FCA, and I had his class, I think, all four years, and just really got to know him as a human being, his character, and he's, you know, one of those very few teachers that stuck out to me as just, as just doing it right all the time, you know. And uh, he raised three – daughters i went to school i think she was a freshman when i was a senior with his oldest daughter and uh i just knew how protective he was of those girls and they were all dancers and they were all popular girls and you had to be a you had to be a stud to date an anderson girl you know (laughs) and so (laughs) when i when i saw them on the on the news um crying at at the conviction I, it caught my attention because I didn't know anything about the case. I just saw my, my teacher and his three girls and his wife there, and I knew they were great people. And so I reached out to him and said, hey, man, I hope everything's okay. What What's the deal with this case? And he said, Jake, I've taught a lot of really good kids in my career. You're one of them, but I've never met a man like this. You know, he's dated my daughter for four years, and I have nothing negative to say about him. And he didn't do this. Right. And I, I said, well – what are you going to do about it? He said, I don't think there's anything we can do. And um, that was a, a sentiment also that a buddy of mine whose daughter went to school with um, Greg and Gabriel, he had said the same thing to me. He said, man, I, our hands are tied. You know, he, he gave up his right to appeal and there's nothing we can do. And that really bothered me because if that's true, then if my brother or my dad or my son ever found themselves in a situation where they were falsely accused of something, you know, if it's true for Greg, if there's nothing we can do for him, then that's true for all of us. Right. And that scared the, that scared the hell out of me. Yeah. And so I looked at this from the very beginning as kind of a proxy war that if I could fight and win this on Greg's behalf, then I knew that I could at least defend my own family. And that's really where, where, where the call started for me. And then fortunately, turns out Greg is a great guy. We've become great friends uh, through this process. Um, but that's why I started. I just, the in, unjustness of the idea that somebody could potentially go to prison labeled a pedophile for 25 years for something they didn't do um, was, was, was something I just couldn't live with that being a reality for me. Right, right. And, that, and then I, th- I think that's what resonates, you know, when you... When you do put yourself in that position, which unfortunately people just don't do, you know, they read about, they read about all wrongful convictions and they read about innocent and they, and they just blow it off and they don't understand 
that by allowing that to happen, it's just going to keep going forward. And without accountability, it's a big problem. And, and the only ones who could really hold things accountable are us as the people, especially as jurors. And, you know, there's a lot we can do. And that's the... Uh, that's right. the part that people are missing, I believe, and that's what gets disturbing. You know, they just allow these things to take place. Yeah, you know, in my very first interview with Keith Hampton, when we were deciding if we were going to hire him as the attorney or not, you know, <laughs> and as the, as the guy that was going to pay for all this, right, right. I, I said, hey, um, you know, selfishly, I guess, I said, hey, can we just go sit down with the district attorney and tell her what we know? Because, right. you know, the Andersons knew about Jonathan from day one, and, and they always felt like that was um, that was the problem here. And so, you know, they, they, they were trying to get Patricia to look into Jonathan the entire time. The investigator, A.J. Karen, who was also in the documentary, uh, he was trying to get Patricia to look at him the whole time, and she just wouldn't do it. And so, you know, I, I, I got... And for Started those who don't, I apologize, Kayo, for those who aren't aware sure. of the story, now, who is Jonathan and what role did he play? Jonathan McCarty, um, appearance-wise, looks a lot like Greg. He's the daycare owner that's living in the house uh, that we believe uh, perpetrated these crimes. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. And, and unfortunately, it seems that uh, they were just focused on their target and they didn't want to uh, change from that. And that's a lot of the times what, what is disturbing, you know, rather than go to where the facts lead you and where the case leads you and where the evidence right. leads you, they get blindsided and they have their target and they don't want to change it. It's almost like they don't want to admit what we may have been wrong when it's not a matter of admitting being wrong. It's a matter of getting the right person. Yeah, and it's even worse than that um, because there was no investigation at all. Really? Uh, they, yeah, they, they never even went to the crime scene. They never interviewed anybody that was living in the house. They never, you know, there was a daycare worker there that was also screaming the entire time, hey, you got the wrong guy. You know, th this situation is a perfect hole in the fence, right? Mm -hmm. the, the odds of two boys living in a house that look exactly like each other, number one, is one in a million. The odds that one of them is a pedophile even further um, makes those odds less than the fact that the daycare owner manipulated and controlled a lot of who Greg hired as an attorney, the investigation done by, I mean, she was very helpful to the Cedar Park police to keep them off of her son's trail, right? So there was a whole lot of that going on too. So here you got this dumb cop that shows up, uh, Chris Daly, who's just ignorant, doesn't know, he, doesn't, he wouldn't even know how to start an investigation, much less lead one. And, and he just shows up, takes the bait completely. And I don't, I don't think he had evil intentions. I just think he's an idiot and he's not qualified to do the job. Right. And unfortunately, that kind of incompetence, look how dangerous it could be. That's the problem. Well, you know? then you got this arrogant, pompous mayor. Uh, well, we got that too, but a pompous police chief that defends that stupidity to the end. I mean, he ends up retiring uh, to avoid ever having to admit that his idiot detective over here made the mistakes that he made. Yeah, and that's what's so incredible. You know, I mean, they go through such lengths to prove that they weren't wrong as opposed to being concerned that they have the wrong person. I mean, and that's, that's that, right. to me, that just really shows the agenda and that shows what it's all, it's all yeah. about. And why do you think that was in this particular case where it relates to Greg? Why do you think they were so focused on him and they just really didn't want to hear anything else? Well, I, I, I think it's because they put themselves in a, in a they, they limited their perspective from the beginning because they thought that it was binary. They thought you either had to believe the child or believe Greg. Right. They didn't even consider that there was an alternate reality um, of a third suspect, right? And so how Greg's name got in this boy's mouth is still a mystery, but I can tell you this, Daly and the CAC worker both simultaneously deleted a ton of emails from both sides. They both deleted the exact same emails and they destroyed the servers to where nobody could find the email chain between them. I mean, it was like 
you know, something we've seen in national politics. I mean, went to great limits to destroy evidence in this case between them on. And I believe what's in those emails is how Greg Kelly's name ever got mentioned, because you, you, you see little hints of it throughout the CAC interview where Daly uses the word box. And it was not unknown for everybody that lived in the house. You see, Jonathan's older brother spent some time in prison. Gotcha. And for 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 charges involving minors and sexual assault of minors. Okay, indecent exposure. I believe I believe was the charge. Okay, so Jonathan's older brother, uh, who I believe is this unidentified third suspect. Um, in fact, I'm quite confident in that. You know, he was in prison, and Jonathan started to kind of look up to that, I guess, because he made the kids in the house call him boss. Gotcha. And so what I believe happened is the boy never said Greg Kelly's name. I believe Greg, uh, the boy went home and said, hey, I wish, you know, my pee-pee was as big as bosses. Right. And then the mom calls the daycare owner and says, hey, who the hell is this boss guy? And why does my son know how big his penis is? And Shama, I believe, is the one that put Greg Kelly's name in the mother's mouth, who then put it in the kid's mouth because the, you know, the, the kid never said Greg Kelly. The kid did say Greg in the interview, but that was after the parents had had a two hour meeting with Shama McCarty. And none of this made the documentary, but had a two hour meeting with Shama McCarty. And the parents even took the boy back to the daycare after the allegation was first made. And I believe the only way you can justify that is Shama going, Hey, don't worry. That was Greg, but he doesn't live here anymore. Right. And now just to get for the listeners who thinking that that would brush that thing that that would brush that under the rug. Right. Yeah. Well, again, now for the listeners, just who is Shama? She is, uh, John's uh, mother, She's the daycare owner where this allegedly took place. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I tell you that, that that's it. Really, is incredible when you start seeing that. And I mean, and what was a lot of when I know uh, one thing we ha were talking about prior was how so much prosecutorial misconduct, you know, takes place. And I'm just curious, certain examples of that that you saw where it relates to this case that really got you going. Well, I, you know, I believe that Jana never even knew about Jonathan because, like I said in my first interview with Keith, I said, "Hey, listen, I want you to go sit down." and show this evidence to Jenna Duty, because I don't believe there's a prosecutor in the world. And this was just my ignorance at the time. I don't believe there's a prosecutor in the world that live with herself. If she knowingly prosecuted the wrong guy and knew that he was going to spend 25 years in prison, labeled a pedophile. I just, I just can't believe that. And he laughed at me. <laughs> he, he started laughing. He goes, Jake, I wish you, that is exactly how this works. You know? And I, I know that you would like to believe in the greater good here, but I'm telling you, these people will defend their convictions at any, they don't care about the truth. They care about winning and they care about defending their name. And it's a systemic pride issue in our justice system. And I, I said, well, listen, I'm going to be the one paying the bill here. So I would like you to at least go try. So he created, and he mentions this in the documentary, he created a, a 30 page PowerPoint and didn't get past page seven. And Janice slammed her hand on the table and said, unless there was another kid living in that house that looks just like Greg, and Keith was like, uh-huh. And she goes, and his name is Gregory Raymond Kelly. We have nothing else to talk about. She walked out. Incredible. And I knew, I knew he was right because he told her, he said, listen, if I flip over all my cards, she will keep any of this from ever being able to be heard in a courtroom. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I couldn't believe it. But, but so I knew then that Keith was right and that Keith was our guy. And so we move forward and the rest is history. Yeah, well, I, I tell you, that's, um, you know, I, I shared the same sentiment as you when I first started in this industry where I was naive in the sense that I would believe if a prosecutor or a state's attorney, you know, realized uh, the evidence and realized they were going down the wrong path and targeting the wrong person that they may pull the brakes on and take a step back and kind of say, well, wait a minute, let me evaluate. But unfortunately, that's not the case. That's just, you know, it's not, you know, when you deal with certain people, it's, it's just a character. It's a character thing, you know, like anything else you have good and bad. But, yeah. But I tell you when you I have, think bad, like any, I think like, yeah, I think like everybody, uh, it just be at some point, it just becomes another day at the office. Right. And they get into, they become very callous to the fact that these are actually human beings and that their lives are actually ruined and that their family's lives are actually ruined. And that that's the exact 
outcome that you want if you got the right guy. But by God, we need our prosecutors to tremble at the thought of putting the wrong guy in prison because it's going to negatively impact them as negatively as it impacts the families and the, the new, now the new victims, right? The people that have been victimized by our criminal justice system. We need our prosecutors and our uh, district attorneys and our judge, judges to tremble at the thought of making mistakes and getting the wrong guy. And they need to go above and beyond. And, and, and we need to quit uh, glorifying their conviction record and rating because, you know, Janet was very proud of her 99.6 con percent conviction rating, which means all she's doing is she's cutting plea deals to the real dirt bags and she's making the good guys that buck the system and refuse to plea. She's making them pay with with blood, you yeah, know, and, exactly. and that, that whole thing is, is terrible. And, and that's really the problem. There's no accountability. I mean, they could do as they want. And even with this, there's really no accountability. You know, they go. They, they ruin people's lives, and then if it does get overturned, it's like, oh, well, okay, I guess we got that wrong, yeah. one wrong. And there's nothing, yeah, you know, even from the judges down, and that's what's so, you know, concerning. If you have a judge who's not fair, not going by the law, they could lead the, uh, the, the verdict any way they want based on what they're going to let right. the jury hear. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, yeah, we all, we all have this romanticized view of... of lawyers and trial and you know we're thinking of tom cruise and, and right. uh you know uh that they're spending all night holding the baseball bat you know trying <laughs> to think about how to defend their client and there's just the reality is these cherry plea deals that they offer uh, create a system that rewards lazy police work lazy investigations and sloppy prosecutions and sloppy lawyers because at the end of the day if the guy just says he did it and he gets a slap on the wrist and five years probation i mean if you really thought greg did this you'd offer him five years of probation exactly when i saw that i mean that told me everything i needed to know and even unfortunately when i saw this poor guy you know where he just you know he wouldn't take it and and that really shows that alone should show somebody that they have the wrong guy nobody wants to admit to that if they didn't take right. it, you know, if somebody did do something like that, they're going to jump all over five years probation. So, oh, yeah. you know, so right there, that that should sum it up. And they just don't care. You know, they just wanted that yeah. conviction. They wanted to keep that percentage high. And then even, you know, what bothers me is when you deal with these jurors, they, they don't they're not free thinkers. I mean, you know, when you don't weigh the evidence, and that's all you see. There's really no evidence there and you still convict somebody. That's a big problem. I think they, uh, they yeah, they, and as jurors, right? So, like, until we can get some laws enacted that re re have a put a greater burden on our prosecutors, we have to understand that the safety valve in this whole deal is us as jurors, and we owe it to the defendant to give them the benefit of the doubt. But even myself, prior to being involved in this, I probably would have lent the benefit of the doubt to the prosecution because I would have assumed that they'd never try to prosecute an innocent guy. So they must know something that they can't tell us. And this guy probably did it. I mean, that's the mindset of most conservative people. Right. And, and yeah. I'm conservative. Right. Yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, I would have thought there's no way this prosecutor is going to run this guy through the cleaners unless they know he did it. And I would have lent them the benefit of the doubt. And you and our justice system demands that the law, that the defense attorney be at their best, the prosecutor be at their best, and that the juror be at their best to to provide a fair outcome. And if the state cannot prove its case beyond a reasonable doubt, it doesn't matter if you think he might have done it, right? That's right. They got a they they have an obligation to prove their case. And until jurors start realizing that and and start shutting down these sloppy investigations and these sloppy, I mean, every juror in there knew that the state did not prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. But right. they started playing that, well, what do you think happened game? And you just can't afford to do that unless there's concrete evidence to convict somebody beyond a reasonable doubt. Yeah, and, that, and that's their problem. They're not understanding their responsibility and they're not living up to it. I mean, in theory, right. in theory, it sounds almost foolproof, you know, beyond a reasonable right. doubt. That means you have no no doubt at all. But they're not doing that. They're, lo they're convicting based on, ah, well, maybe he did or she did do it. And that's not yeah. how it works. And that's, that's really the big problem, and that's what's crippling things. And, and just like you said, the problem is they try to, um, even before somebody's, you know, arraigned, between what they do with the media and all the stories they put out, they're already tainting the jury pool. They're already putting those, 
thoughts in people's head about who's guilty and who's not. And then by the time the defendant's in front of the jurors, they already have this individual guilty, and then the concept is reversed. Now it's you're trying to prove your innocence. And that's that's not the that's way it's suppo- and that's not the way it's supposed to work. Well, and then the reason it's supposed to work that way will prove your innocence. Hell, I can't prove that I didn't do it, right? Right. I can tell you I was never there, nope. but I can't I can't go back seven years and prove that to you, and I shouldn't have to. Right? No. No. Um, and and the the thing is, you know, my dad was in ministry and in children's ministry my entire life, and he always told me, growing up, he said, "Son, as long as you're never alone." with other people's kids, as I was getting into my high school years, as long as you're never alone with other people's kids, you don't have to worry about false allegations. He said the people that put themselves in that situation where they're alone with other people's kids that have to worry about false allegations. And so I just uh, operated as, as if that was true, but Greg was never alone with these kids. You know, this right. is like the worst case scenario because, you know, that even throws that rule out of the book. You know, he yep. was never alone with these children he, he, you know, he saw them in passing and he gave them high fives and stuff like that as he'd walk in from, you know, working out and stuff like that. But he, he, he never was alone with these children one on one. And uh, and so you would think that that would be his, you know, his protection that he needed. But it, it didn't. It, you know, when you get an angry uh, prosecutor that's dead set on, you know, proving up this child's allegation regardless of if it was tainted or if he'd been coached or any of that stuff then then you end up with situations like this yes and and that and that's the devastating effect of it right you know if they don't do their job and they don't investigate it properly and they just get the bare minimum and go forward with it i mean look at the damage that could be done and you know the average citizen would think, well, if they're not guilty, they're going to be not be found guilty, and they don't understand that's that's, right. that's not how it works. That's just not that's how not it true works. at all. You know, it's not true at all. Yeah, I was asked very early on by a reporter, is it better for a guilty person to go free or for an innocent person to be locked up? And I and I and I challenged her. I said, Are you serious? Is that re- is that a real question? And she was like, Yeah. And I guess she thought it was like a chicken or the egg thing. And I, and I'm like, Look. If you convict an innocent person, it's a double negative because the guilty guy's going free. That's I mean, right. that just makes zero sense to me why that's even a valid question. Of course, it makes more sense to have a guilty guy get off if there's not a um, successful investigation that leads to a prosecution than it is to just slap an innocent guy in there to say that the crime is solved and make everybody feel better. Meanwhile, uh, the, the actual criminal is walking around victimizing more people, which is actually what happened in this case as well, as you saw in the fifth episode. Right, right. Well, I, you know, the problem is with even... And she's not, hey, and she's not the only one. Yeah, with questions like that, it actually just shows the mindset because you right. know, when you have a mindset like that, it's almost as if you're speaking on deaf ears because they just don't get right. it. You know, they just don't understand right. it. And, and the burden of proof is on the government. So if there is somebody guilty, then they have to get the case together and they have That's to, right. and it's on the state and they have to put together the case to make sure they convict the, the guilty party, but not to, not to tailor the investigation to convict somebody innocent. It's, it's right. lunacy, lunacy to even make that correlation. Right. Yeah. yeah. I believe, man, we have a systemic pride issue in our criminal justice system and we have to address that. Because, you know, pride for any of us leads to laziness. You know, if you're, if you're overly confident in anything, in your job, in your um, hobbies, whatever it is, then you're going to get lazy and you're going to get sloppy. Right. And, and that's what – and because the way that they've, you know, I feel like manipulated the rules of the game, you know, our prosecutors in this day and age are, are, are receiving the benefit of the doubt. And it's a slam dunk for them. I mean, how how in the hell could you have a 98.6 or 99.6 conviction? Are you telling me you, out, out of a thousand people, you only get it wrong four times? Well, it's like you said, because, you know, they, they, they force those pleas as well. And, and unfortunately, you know, I've done a lot right. of research even on people who plea to things they didn't do simply because they yeah, didn't yeah. they didn't have faith in the system. They didn't want to risk, say, right. 20 years if you're offered, you know, a year in prison. I mean, they just don't want to risk that. Because, oh, yeah. because the well, fact I, of the I, matter I, is, people do get found guilty who are innocent. I mean, you know firsthand. <laughs> yeah, and I think especially absence of sexual crimes, right? 
Um, I think that probably is the smart move with the way things are, are, are set up, you yeah, know? I agree. But most people, most innocent people will not accept the label of pedophile. No. Regardless of no. the risk. No, exactly. For the rest of your Exactly. No, that, just that, that's in a class of itself, you know, and that, that, yeah. that that's treated totally separately. I, I agree with you 100% yeah. on that. Oh, I can tell you right now, if if, 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 if Greg was falsely accused of murder or uh, theft or anything else, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now because he would have never been convicted. They would have never even tried the case. I mean, there was no, abs there was absolutely no evidence. And so, you know, we, and we do have to treat crimes against children differently because a lot of times the evidence is lacking and the testimony of the child is so important because normally there's only two people that know right. uh, what happened. Right. right? right. And, and so I, I, I firmly believe that, that, that that's, that's allowable, should be allowable, but that's why that. And why we need really a, a the, the community to understand if your child ever reports anything to you, you don't, you, you just stop and you get them to a professionally trained, trained child therapist at a, at a child advocacy center or something along those nature. And you let somebody that's trained to not ask leading questions, to not coach the child uh, system right? Uh, so that that evidence is pure and intact. Yes. Well, you know, on my prior episode, I spoke about uh, the documentary, and I and I said, this, in my opinion, there's nothing worse in life than a pedophile. But what's what's terrible is how you label an innocent person that and give them that stigma, without without making sure you vet it a hundred percent. I mean, it's yeah. just you, you're ruining somebody's life. And what I saw that really bothered me, where it relates to Greg, is. He had a lot going for him. This kid was going to, you know, play for college. He had, he had a phenomenal scholarship, three different schools. They just stripped all of that away from this guy. And That's I mean, correct. And I mean, to do that, to ruin somebody's life, you can't get that back. You can't yeah, get that back. Yeah, and then to mock us and, and be flipping about it on top of that just goes to show you. Yeah, it really does. And I just, one thing I, I wanted to ask you, as far as the um, obstacle of not being able to file an appeal, how did you guys get over that as far as moving forward? How were you able to get through that? We had to, we, we had to get a new DA elected that would, wouldn't oppose it. Gotcha. So we had, to, we had to go the political route, which is why it took so long. I see. Hey, Dominic, thank you. I've got to run. I appreciate your time, and, and I appreciate you getting the word out. And if you, if you ever want to do a follow-up, please let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you because this is an important issue. Yeah, no, Jake, I thank you, and I really appreciate your time. And, you know, uh, I'm really glad at, at least finally things were done the right way. And, again, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Take Bye. care. And uh, that was it. I, I thought that was a uh, very enlightening uh, interview. I mean, j just to give the general public an idea of what takes place when you're a target. And it just goes to show anyone could be a target. So when you sit there and you think that these things don't affect you, they do affect you. And here you go with, with Jake, just a uh, uninterested third party getting involved. You know, uh, and I really commend the guy. And, I, and he's a gentleman and he's got a lot of common sense. He's very intelligent. And I just thank him and, and the integrity that he had to also foot the bill for the legal team to help Greg Kelly is just characteristics that you don't really see today. So I hope everybody found this episode as intriguing and interesting as I did. And I'll talk to you next time. Thank you.